Okay, so with this session, we've got Dr. Braxton Hunter, who is a personal friend of mine. And with everyone else, I've been given like a little introduction on like their academic background and stuff. But I just want to tell you a little bit about Braxton, who he is to me. So he's a very, very good friend of mine. He and I, I actually found out about him first. Uh, I saw a debate that he did with Matt Dillahunty that's posted on his YouTube channel, Trinity Radio. You're, it's okay. You can pull out your phones and like go and subscribe to his channel right now if you want. He said, yes, please. So, uh, but I, I saw this debate and I immediately thought, this guy, I need to, I need to like talk to him and start promoting his channel. He, he, he did that good in this debate. So I recommend checking that out. But Braxton to me personally has been such a good friend and he's been in, uh, in times of, of uh, deep need, he's been there for me. And so he's just an awesome person and I can't be more happy to uh, bring, go, go ahead and come up here, Braxton. I'm so happy to have him here. He's talking about the, the core facts. Are, what, is he, what, do you, what is the title of your message? Core facts is fine. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, give me a hug. Yeah, I love you, man. Love you too, bud. And all that's true about you too. Uh, you've meant a lot to me. Well, I'm super excited to, to hear your talk, so let's get going. Let's do it. All right. Hey, guys, I'm so glad that you all are here, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, I saw some enthusiasm. I heard it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what we're going to do today, by the way, if you're the type of person that takes pictures like you, sir, with that awesome camera or cell phones, you've got one job, and that job is to make me look tall and thin. So the more you can make me look like Cameron, be awesome. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm glad that you guys are here. And what I'm going to be doing is, you remember when some of you who watch Capturing Christianity, when William Lane Craig and Graham Oppie had a discussion about math, you remember that? And then a couple of weeks after that, Cameron posted a video, explain it to me like I'm five. That's me. That's this talk. Not, not on that subject, but on other subjects. And the reason I think that's so important is because if you're out there and you're a father or a mother that came with one of your kids, or you're somebody who goes to this church and you came, or you're a friend that came and you think, you know, I, I'm really not sure I'm tracking with it. I like what's happening, but I'm not sure I'm tracking with it exactly. I'm your air support. Here I am, and we're gonna explain it, let, thank you. We're gonna explain it like we're, we're five, okay? And hopefully all of your questions will come as though you're five as well, that would be awesome. So, um, so what I wanna talk to you about today is basically a way that you can organize your understanding of the, some of the best arguments for the existence of the Christian God in a way that you can remember easily. So I'm gonna explain some of these arguments really in a, in a, you know, like I said, like you're five and like I'm five. And then we're also gonna take those and come up with a way to remember them easily. So I think this is important because right now we are living in a world where we desperately need Christian answers to some of the most difficult questions that we face. We definitely need to be presenting the gospel and using apologetics to do something. I said this in my breakout session and I'll say it now. Unfortunately, it's fortunate that we are living in a golden age of apologetics resources, right? I mean, when you think about it, you can find books, videos, blog articles on any imaginable question or challenge to the Christian faith. That's a wonderful thing. But unfortunately, not many people are doing much with it. I mean, it, they use it for, what it really is, is people like me and you sitting around on the back row of church on Sunday after the preacher gets done, talking about some new argument we heard, some debate we saw, or book we read, and we love talking about it because we're geeks for apologetics like some people are geeks for Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. That's also me, by the way. <laughs> and uh, the most devoted among us will go home and we'll get on the internet and do apologetics by arguing with people. Muslims, Hindus, other Christians, whoever gets in the line of fire. And um, then you get done, you feel like, wow, I've really done the Lord's work. Well, you've really just been a jerk is, what you, is what's happened. But then you go back to watching Star Wars and Lord of the Rings again. Um, that, you know, there, there is a benefit to apologetics for your personal entertainment. I'm a geek for apologetics and theology. That's perfectly fine. And apologetics is also good for building up your own faith, right? However, one of the most important things, in my opinion, that we can do with apologetics is to use apologetics to reach other people with the gospel message. What is the point of defending the Christian faith, but the people might believe the Christian faith, right? And we're living in a day and age when we need those kinds of things. This uh, is not a shock to most of you, but for some of you it might be. 
but I think it was 2008 before Christopher Hitchens, the late great atheist debater, um, who spawned a generation of new atheist uh, sorts of arguments and ideas, um, or at least, um, you know, rhetoric maybe, some of it, um, wrote a book, and the book was called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And in that book, the content from that book has been used by a new generation of atheists and also picked up by pop culture and quoted in shows like Orange is the New Black. So this is very much in our culture and in a day and age in the West and and beyond the West where we have, where this is permeating our culture and is now a part of our culture in a place, in a way where people are aware, we definitely need to know what we believe and why we believe it and how to give people an answer. And so as a result of that, what I wanna do is is to give you a way, I think, that we can do that today. And so here's what we're gonna do. First of all, I wanna share with you that um, this can work. This can be successful. Um, There is um, a a young man who I was in our local church. I tell you that because I didn't go off. I wasn't asked to come somewhere and it was set up, but a young man in our local church, I shared this with our breakout group, was an atheist and his mother said he'd be willing to talk to you though because he's ready to hear some of the good reasons to believe that Christianity is true. So we met and we began to talk about the core facts that I'm gonna be sharing with you today. And this is what Drew, his name's Drew, and this comes from a blog article that he wrote for our website, braxtonhunter.com, like Frank Turek says, look how humble I am, right? braxtonhunter.com. But uh, he wrote this as a blog article for our website and, and in the blog article he says this about that experience. He says, we met for lunch at a local Mexican restaurant. By the way, that's a good pro tip. Mexican restaurants are excellent places to have worldview discussions. Something about, I don't know why it is, it's a mystery of the universe, but the cheese and the flour and the salsa is flowing. People's defenses are down, it's just great. Um, the amen, he says, that's right. Um, and so, uh, but, but he says that, he says, we met for lunch at a local Mexican restaurant and that's when my life really changed for the better. We continued meeting and discussing God and the truth about Jesus. I was baffled at how much evidence there really is. No one had ever talked to me about Christian apologetics. It surprised me to hear that there were people out there that are trying to give evidence for God's existence and who Jesus was. Apologetics made me take a second look at what religion was and why Christianity is worth believing. Now, to tell you the rest of the story, uh, Drew actually not only became a Christian because God used apologetics to reach him with the message of the gospel. But on top of that, he actually enrolled in an apologetics program at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, where I teach, and because he wanted to learn how to do the same thing with all his friends and other people. Beyond that, he then asked, can I get a job at Trinity answering the phone so that when people call to try and find their way to their particular sort of ministry, I wanna be the first person they talk to so that I can tell them how excited I am about what happened in my life. And all of that happened because of how God used these core facts. And none of, this, none of these core facts are things that I came up with, but it's a good way of organizing things. All right, so here's what I want you to do. If you're a person who takes notes, and I understand that note take, by the way, note taking is cool or something, but if you're the type of person that takes notes, here's what I would ask you to do. Down your left-hand side of the page, this is my right, your left-hand side of the page, I would write down vertically, like up and down, and leave space between each letter. I'm gonna give you a phrase. Now, Um, I have become recently a weird dad. Are there any other weird dads around here? All right, amen, praise the Lord. Um, Well, see, um, my daughter is now 13. She used to think my jokes were funny and I was cool. Now all of a sudden, somehow overnight, my jokes are lame and I'm lame. And so I've become a weird dad. And so this is kind of a weird dad thing. It's a cheesy thing, but I think it'll be helpful. So this is an acrostic. Do you know what an acrostic is? It's a phrase where each letter of the phrase stands for something else. So that if you can remember all of the, um, if you can remember the phrase, you can remember the case, a case at least, for the existence of the Christian God. So it'll work that way. So I'd leave space between each letter of the phrase if you're taking notes like that. And these, for a lot of you, these are not new things. Again, this is explained to me like I'm five, right? So if you're here and this is new, it'll help you. But for those of you for whom it is not new, what I would encourage you to do is think about how you can use something like this to take the knowledge you already have and reach people with the message of the gospel, okay? So this is more practical, uh, than, than some of the other things that we've discussed, all right? So, um, so the C, so let's start with that C. C, I bet you could guess. I'm not gonna make you guess. But C stands for cause. The universe had a cause. 
Now, many of you are familiar with cosmological arguments and famously William Lane Craig's Kalam cosmological argument. But you know, for those of you for whom uh, you, you have a life in the church of studying the Bible, you know, the Bible just flatly tells us this. In Genesis 1, we learn in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The author of Genesis just flatly says that. Um, and so we know that, but what if you didn't have the Bible? Could you know that there's a God who made everything if you didn't have the Bible to tell you that? I think, I think so. And one way that you can do that is to think about the fact that the universe needs a cause. So famously, William Lane Craig's argument, he's the modern champion of the Kalam cosmological argument, and he says uh, everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, so the universe must have a cause. I hear you all whispering it back to me as I'm saying it, right? And uh, what, you know, there are objections to each one of those premises, and Ben's on the back row. He could probably give us all his favorite objections to this, right, Ben? Love you, Ben. Hey, man. Uh, I really do love you, Ben. Um, but uh, he could give us objections to these things, but really I just want us to focus right here on crystallizing the idea for you. Um, I, I think it's, it's kind of intuitive, at least, for most of us, that when something begins to exist, there's a cause for it. And there are different types of causation, but to speak about it a, a, a different way, um, I think we are very young when we first begin to realize causation is a thing and understand some things about some types of causation. So for example, when my uh, oldest daughter was nine months old and not 13 before I was a weird dad, she, uh, I wanted to do an experiment on her <laughs> to see if she could, uh, had developed the dexterity to catch a ball if I tossed it to her. And so at nine months old, I tossed her the ball and it hit her in the head and she fell over. It's a real thing that happened. It's not a preacher story. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm a preacher, I can say that. Uh, and, and so she fell over. But then she did something that revealed to me, and don't look at me like that, okay? It wasn't a hard ball. It was a soft ball. I mean, not a soft ball. <laughs> a soft ball, right? Um, but I realized my daughter was gonna be a philosopher because she looked around. What was she looking around for? She was looking around for what caused the ball to fly through the air, causing her to fall over. And I realized, not only does she understand there's a cause, she understands a chain of causation of sorts there. And she saw me with my hand up like this. And that caused her, in a sense, to retaliate by making a dirty diaper. <laughs> which caused me then to call out to her mother. <laughs> now, isn't that a beautiful expression of a certain type of cause and effect? Maybe not. But... Uh, the point is, from a very young age, we already understand certain things about certain kinds of causation. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing. So uh, you, you might say, okay, well, Braxton, I hear you saying, everything that begins to exist uh, needs a cause. And, and I, the universe began to exist, okay, uh, that, that can be controversial. We talk about that kind of stuff a lot, but, but you might not find it controversial, and, and the people you're talking with in your everyday life might not find it too controversial. And so you say, okay, well, so then the universe needs a cause, but that doesn't tell me what the cause is. I can't know anything about the cause from that. Well, I think maybe you can know some things. So um, you could say, well, okay, I could start by looking at what couldn't be the cause, right? I could start by looking at what couldn't be the cause. Um, what, what cannot serve? Well, you know, things can't bring themselves into existence, right? You didn't decide to be born, Things don't bring themselves into existence. And so the universe is made generally of, of three things, time, space, and physical matter. This is how the argument often goes. And so if um, whatever the cause of the universe is can't be those things because those are the things that we're trying to explain. Time, space, and matter can't bring themselves into existence, we might, we might think. So um, I've realized, because I've done this talk enough, that this is where it gets kind of confusing for people who might not already be familiar with the arguments. And so I've come up with a way of explaining it that is both fun and lovable and will also make you like me more. And those are the kinds of illustrations I love. Okay, I I'm a big fan of the Toy Story franchise. How many of you guys like Toy Story? Raise your hands, all right? The rest of you, what's wrong with you? What, who are you trying to impress? Um, and, uh, and so let's, my favorite character in the Toy Story films is Woody. Real original, right? But um, I like Woody. Anybody else like Woody, by the way? Any, is there anybody whose favorite character is Buzz Lightyear? Is there anybody whose favorite character are the little aliens that worship the claw? Anybody? Okay, ma'am, that could indicate a serious psychological problem, but we'll talk after it's over. Um, but, but, you know, what if I said, okay, well, I love the Toy Story movies, but I'm asked to the question, what if somebody asks me the question, who or what caused that digital universe of the Toy Story films to come into existence? And what if I said, well, 
I think Woody explains that universe coming into existence because he's the best character in the film, in my opinion. So he probably brought that universe into existence. Well, that would be silly. And why would that be silly? Well, one reason among many is because he's a part of what we're trying to explain. He's in that, he's a part of that digital universe. And so the, the universe being brought into existence, the digital universe of Toy Story, requires people outside of that digital universe, filmmakers, voice artists, musicians, um, actors, those kind of things. Well, in a similar way that Woody and Buzz and Mr. Potato Head and Slinky Dog can't bring the digital universe that they're in into existence because they're a part of the thing that we're trying to explain, in a similar way, Time, space, matter, the things that comprise this physical universe can't serve as the cause, or we might suggest, might, can't serve as the cause of the universe because they'd be bringing themselves into existence. So what can we know about this cause? Well, if that's true, then that would mean that the, universe, uh, that the cause of the universe is spaceless, timeless, not made of matter, and that's interesting. Now, at this point, someone might say, well, okay, but, and by the way, this is where it gets super controversial, but someone might say, okay, well, that's fine, but how do I know that it's like a mind, like a person, like, like God, something like that? And, you know, as uh, Trent was mentioning last night, there are things that we might think of as spaceless, timeless, non-material. Uh, perhaps numbers are like that, perhaps shapes, like he mentioned. Uh, but those things, as he said last night, are, um, they don't have causal powers. They can't do anything. They can't cause something to happen. And so you need something that has those causal powers and a mind independent of a physical body, if such a thing exists, could serve as that thing. Now, why should we think maybe that's the case? Well, this could get a little, a little technical, but my particular area that I love to study is free will. And it seems to me that in a state of timeless nothingness where there's no determinism at play and there's nothing random happening to lead to uh, this cause, it seems to me that this cause would have to have what we might call libertarian freedom but free will is something that personal agents have. And so that's one good reason, argued by some, including me, that to think that this universe must have a mind as its source. So just in the first few moments of us spending time together, and I can tell we're developing such a wonderful relationship, don't laugh at me. You all laugh at the most insulting moments. Do you know that? <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we've already got a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, sufficiently powerful, it would have to be sufficiently powerful to begin the universe, right? Um, exceedingly wise, we might say, to make sure it turns out the way it should, mind. And that is, at base, what Jews and Christians might think of, or at least it's one thing, when they look at, in the beginning, God. Now, um, there's a lot of objections, as I say, and I know that for many of you, those objections are like boiling up in your head. But understand, that's important, but what we're trying to do is crystallize these arguments down where they're understandable in a certain way. All right, so the C is for cause. The universe has a cause. But then uh, the next thing we want to say, the O in core facts stands for order. The universe has order. Now, just before I spoke in the last main session, you heard Dr. Gart talk about that order in an incredible way. How is this order possible? How did it get started? That's an amazing thing because with order, what we're talking about are design arguments. And this isn't too difficult for, for us to express to people who maybe aren't familiar because most people who are Christians and have thought about worldview and pop culture and what's going on in the world, whether or not they're familiar with some of these other arguments, they often are familiar with design arguments. I mean, you know, we saw the hummingbird yesterday. I mean, that should be like the logo for the conference, I think. Um, work, it, work it in, Cameron. Yeah, work the hummingbird in. But uh, you walk outside this building, you pick up a leaf. The leaf has veins that carry nutrients to the different parts of the leaf. The leaf has a function in the tree. The tree has a function in the ecosystem. Hey, it turns out that look at the trees is actually not a bad place to start. So you, it has this design. Look at your own physical body, your hands. Just look at them. Look at them. Your hands are clearly made to grip things. However they got to that point, that is a function they have that seems pretty obvious to us. Your mouth is made to eat and to breathe and to talk, and at least two of those things are my favorite things. I am a satisfied customer when it comes to eating and talking, right? <laughs> and breathing, I guess. But, but there's an order to it. Now, uh, you might say, and of course this was covered somewhat in the, in the talk before, but you might say, well, evolution handles all that. Well, I think that Dr. Gart did a fantastic job this morning explaining why the, uh, the fact of evolution would not cause a problem for, for this argument because um, how did it get started? It's, it's like, I liked how you said it was like a big bang, another big bang, that was great. But then on top of that, 
even if you explained everything biological with evolution, which you can't do, that's according to Dr. Gard, could, in terms of getting started. But then on top of that, it wouldn't explain the fine tuning of the universe outside of biological life that makes biological life a possibility. So um, I, I think this is a great way to encapsulate it. Um, but Hugh Ross, many of you are familiar with Hugh Ross, and in the book Creator and the Cosmos, he's talking about the balance necessary between electrons and protons. And he's talking about how that's just one of many things that needs to be right in order for life to be possible. And he says this, quote, he says the chances of the balance being right is one in 10 to the 37th power if it's by chance. And he says, one part in 10 to the 37th power is such an incredibly sensitive balance that it is hard to visualize. The following analogy might help. Cover the entire North American continent in dimes all the way up to the moon, a height of about 239,000 miles. And then he says, next, pile dimes from here to the moon on a million other continents the same size as North America. Paint one dime red and mix it into the billion piles of dimes. Blindfold a friend and ask him to pick out one dime. The odds that he will pick the red dime are one in 10 to the 37th power. And this is only one of the parameters that is so delicately balanced to allow life to form. So this is an incredible thing, but I don't wanna to spend too much more time on it because we've had two incredible talks already on that subject at this conference with Luke Barnes and Cy Gart. So O is for order. But then we have R. R is for rules. Now, Rules, you might be thinking, I mean, like the laws of physics or the, the, the laws of logic or something like that. Well, those are super interesting, and we can use those for other purposes in apologetics to make other arguments. But here I'm really talking about moral rules. The universe seems to have these moral rules, these values and duties that allow for us uh, or, or uh, show us how we should behave in the world. And it's an amazing thing. There was a lot of talk about that last night. And so um, I also don't wanna to spend too much time focusing on that, but I wanna say this. Primarily, when we think about morality, are we thinking of something that is objective? Both men last night wanted to argue a certain kind of objectivity. But are these things objective or are these things subjective? What's the difference really? Well, subjective things are like, um, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Well, I think the chocolate is the best kind of ice cream. Well, okay, well, that's just like your opinion, man. You know, um, that's, uh, that's, that's what that is. But, or bald-headed, bearded men are the most attractive kinds of men. Um, I wish that were objectively true, but I don't think that it is. At least my wife maybe thinks so. I hope, that's what she tells me. Um, but anyway, uh, so, you, so you have subjective things, you have objective things. Objective things are more like, uh, two plus two equals four. Even if everybody thinks two plus two equals three, two plus two still equals four, and everybody's just wrong. So you have these objective and subjective things like that. The question is, what is morality? Is morality more like uh, a matter of opinion like that, um, or like dependent on the subject, or is it more objective that if everyone thinks a certain thing, that uh, like that this is the thing you'll always hear, so I'll give it to you now. Uh, is it really wrong to torture a child just because you enjoy the sounds of their screams? Is that really wrong? Well, the question is, okay, it's wrong. We all wanna agree it's wrong, but is it wrong in terms of, uh, in a subjective way or in an objective way like mathematics? Like it's really wrong, and if you don't think it's wrong, you're just wrong. Okay, well, I, I think most of us wanna say objective, and if you say subjective, there's further discussion we can have. But if we say it's objective, well, then in such a case, we, we have to ask, well, what, what grounds that objectivity? And so we would say that the best explanation uh, for this morality is God. So, so far we've seen three things. We've seen that God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation for the order of the universe, that's C and O. God is the best explanation, I would say, for the rules uh, that we have, the moral rules that we have. Now, you see, all these are arguments you're very familiar with if you've been studying apologetics, but putting them together in this way can be really helpful. And I'm gonna show you another reason that it can in just a moment. So you have the C, the O, and the R. Then we come to the E. Now, don't you hate it, by the way, whenever people come to conferences and you can tell that this guy, he just developed this whole talk so that he could sell you a book. Don't you hate that? I hate when people do that. It's really annoying because I'd rather them just tell me something. That said, I have a book. <laughs> and this book is a fuller explanation of everything I'm saying with much more detail and covers many of the objections to each of these things. And in the book, when it comes to the E, the, the E in Corfax, which by the way stands for experience, 
You, you know, William Lane Craig makes this move a lot, but in the book I argue, I talk about religious experience arguments. But um, putting that aside, it's good for the way Craig uses it too, which is to say, well, it's, it's, uh, you can have an experience of God right now through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's at this point that I want to show you something that I think is kind of cool that we can do with this case. And that is that core facts, as an acrostic that you see there at the top of the book, the core in core facts is all about theistic arguments. The facts in core facts are all about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, why is that good? Well, that's because if you run into someone who already believes that there's a God, but just doesn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, drop the core and go with the facts. Give them the facts of the resurrection. So this is a versatile thing, I think, and it's a way to remember it if you're new to this kind of stuff. By the way, um, I wanna share this because he happens to be here, but my friend Chase, who watches Trinity Radio, our channel, he took his, he's a youth pastor and he took his youth group through this study. And this is what he had to say last night. Um, he says, I taught over core facts with my youth group for a couple of months and saw a huge impact from it. The evangelistic apologetics approach was easily received and effectively applied by my students. They were able to not only defend their faith, but also transition into gospel presentations in part because of the focus on biblical truth and application. Not only was there, as well as my, evangelistic approach strengthened, but so was our faith. The apologetics added a new level of depth and strength to our personal faith, which has been much appreciated and much needed. So I really appreciate him writing that for me, but what it shows is you can take youth through this, you can take a small group at your church through this, and you can go much deeper than I'm able to go right here. So let's get into the facts then. And I have an abbreviated uh, PowerPoint here, so I'll just go back to the core facts so you can watch the facts there. But um, So the F in facts stands for fatal. Jesus' wounds on the cross were fatal. That is to say, Jesus died. Um, now, this is something that, uh, what I'm gonna share with you, the facts that I'm gonna share to build this case are mostly what are considered by, in historiography, bedrock facts. And in order, for, in order for something to be considered a bedrock fact that is almost past doubting, it has to be highly evidenced and it has to enjoy the consensus of scholars. And that's true about the death of Jesus, that he died. Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. We have testimony of that from one of the greatest historians of ancient Rome, Cornelius Tacitus. And uh, like I said, scholars are, are, um, are in, in a consensus about this. Um, you hear that a lot, but I think it's important to point it out because I'm not an expert in historiography. Uh, but uh, let me give you some quotes here about Jesus dying by Roman crucifixion. So maybe you want a Christian talking about it. Here's N.T. Wright. He says, the hoary old theory that Jesus did not really die on the cross. By the way, the reason this is important that he died, you say, well, everybody dies, right? That's not impressive. Yeah, but the reason it's important is because some people argue that the reason Jesus was able to appear to people after his quote unquote death is because he didn't really die. Somehow, even though it would be really difficult with modern technology in the 21st century to help a man come back after a crucifixion like that, somehow these guys in the cool of the tomb were able to do it. Here's what, um, here's what N.T. Wright says. The hoary old theory that Jesus did not really die on the cross but revived in the cool of the tomb has likewise nothing to recommend it. And it is noticeably important that even those historians who are passionately committed to denying the resurrection do not go by this route. Roman soldiers, after all, were rather good at killing people. And when given a rebel leader to practice on, they would have had several motives for making sure the job was done properly. So that's interesting from a Christian. All right, well, what if you don't like a Christian? What if you want an atheist? All right, Gerd Ludemann, German atheist, New Testament scholar says, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Well, maybe you don't want a Christian or an atheist. Maybe you'd rather have a Jewish scholar. Well, Geza Vermesh says, the passion of Jesus is part of history. Well, maybe you don't want a Christian or an atheist or a Jewish scholar. Maybe you'd like a liberal New Testament scholar. John Dominique Crossan writes, there is not the quote, slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. He says, Jesus' crucifixion is as sure as anything historical can ever be. And maybe you don't want a Christian, an atheist, a Jewish, or a liberal scholar. Maybe you like a liberal Jewish scholar. Paula Fredrickson says, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved, particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. And of course, as I said, we have extra biblical evidence about this from people like Cornelius Tacitus. So Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Uh, the, the A in facts is for appeared. Jesus appeared to others after his death. Now, the people won't, uh, no, I don't need a brother. Thank you though. I appreciate that. So helpful. Um, 
Now, it's not that the consensus of scholars agrees that Jesus appeared, but it's, it's that rather that these people had experiences that at least they interpreted as appearances of the risen Christ, and there's uh, risen Jesus. And there's several reasons for this. One reason is the change in practice and belief that uh, these people had in, almost immediately overnight. Um, it's the rapid expansion of the church. And uh, I think that's really interesting. You know, where I come from in Nashville, Tennessee, where I spent my teenage years, we have this phenomenon that I wonder if you've heard of here, and that is Elvis impersonation. Are you familiar with this phenomenon? And um, if you look at Elvis impersonation, how many of you would say you've seen more than one Elvis in your life? Would you raise your hand? More than 100 maybe, and you're on TV and everything? I mean, maybe. Okay, why is that? Well, um, I heard a pastor say this one year at a conference, and I just thought it was fantastic. I'm probably going to butcher the numbers, but in the ni- late 1970s, someone was keeping track of this. There's actually a Wikipedia article about this, and there was something like 170 Elvis impersonators on record. Now, who's keeping a record of that? No clue. Sounds like a wasted life to me, but, uh, but Elvis impersonators. All right. In the 1990s, by the mid-90s, it was like something like 170,000 Elvis impersonators. And they made the point that if at that rate of expansion, if that continues, then by 2025, one in every three people will be an Elvis impersonator. (laughs) So just look to your left and look to your right. Who's it gonna be, right? Um, But why are there all of these Elvis impersonators? If there never was an Elvis, if he never did all these incredible things, had the pork chop sideburns and the flashy outfits and was a heartthrob, even though that sounds strange today to some of you, and was a movie star and wrote all these number one hits and all those kind of things, would there even be one Elvis impersonator today? No. It's because people saw incredible things in Elvis's life and and it changed them in a very interesting way. Um, (laughs) Similarly, if the, you know, I think about the fact that uh, Jesus, these people changed because it seems like they experienced something that led to such a dramatic, very quick change that then spread rapidly. To quote Fredrickson again, the disciples' conviction that they had seen the risen Christ, their permanent relocation to Jerusalem, their principled inclusion of Gentiles as Gentiles, um, all these are historical bedrock facts known past doubting about the earliest community after Jesus' death. E.P. Saunders says the Jesus, that Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. Gary Habermas, famously recording what the scholars say about this, has been cataloging the positions of scholars who have written on this since 1975, and he comments, quote, as firmly as ever, most contemporary scholars agree that after Jesus' death, his early followers had experiences that they at least believed were appearances of the risen Lord. So you have, he died, Um, People had experiences that they interpreted as appearances of the risen Christ. And then we have C. C is for commitment. And the commitment level of the earliest disciples, such that they were willing to face persecution, willing to face death. Now, you probably know that uh, Sean McDowell did his doctoral research on this. And so we can't say that all of these apostles died martyrs' deaths. So we can't say, uh, we, you know, we can say with high confidence a couple of them. He's got a scale of confidence for that. Um, and we can't say much more about the other disciples. But what we can say is it seems like they were willing to die because of the things they were saying, the positions they were put in, and those sorts of things. So it seems like they were willing to die for this belief. And this is... Uh, a really interesting thing because it seems like you really have to believe something really strongly in order to be willing to face persecution or perhaps die for it. You know, that doesn't seem like something that really happens a whole lot. Now, you might be thinking of like the, the uh, Muslims who flew the planes in the towers on September 11th. Didn't they die for something that wasn't true? I think so, but here's the difference. And I can't, I, listen, that's an incredible amount of devotion to a religion to be willing to do that. But here's the thing. Those Muslims who flew the planes into the towers on September 11th were not in a position to know for sure whether what they believed was actually true or whether it was not true. But the earliest Christians might have been in a better place to know that because if it was made up by someone, it was made up by some one of them or they could have been confused or mistaken. Those are other objections we could talk about. But it seems that they were, they were really committed and that speaks to this thing. Let's just imagine that today we did, and by the way, this would not be a good time for somebody to go to the bathroom because uh, you're gonna come back in and think that I'm starting a cult and it's way too early for you to think that I'm a heretic, all right? <laughs> Let's imagine that we decided we were gonna start our own religion. We're gonna make one up. We're gonna lie. We're gonna make this thing up. And uh, since it's the Capturing Christianity Conference, here's what we're gonna say. 
Now, we're, imagine, we're all gonna make this up. We're gonna lie about it is what we're saying. And we're gonna, get, we're gonna say that Cameron over here was, um, was, was down here and someone came in with a, with a sword, odd in this day and age, but stuck Cameron through with a sword and he fell down and died, all right? Uh, that's a sad thing, all right? You guys love Cameron? <laughs> so let's imagine that, we stuck, that somebody stuck him through the sword and then after an hour while we're all praying and crying and all these things, um, the hole closes up supernaturally Cameron stands up and begins to expound wisdom to us. And then we're gonna call it, we gotta have a name for this religion, so let's call it, we could call it Cameronism, but that doesn't really, do it. Bertuzianity, Bertuzianity, that'd be good. It's got kind of a religious flair to it, uh, yeah. Bertuzianity, and let's say that we get really popular for this. We start writing books, we uh, start speaking at conferences, we have our own conference circuit, our own publishers, we get on the Good Morning America, we get on the Today Show, CBS This Morning, and we're all talking about this incredible thing in our new religion of Bertuzianity. <laughs> and we do all of that. Now, that's all fine. I, you know, people might live for that lie as long as it brings them money, fame, the appreciation of the opposite sex, something like that, but... If someone sticks a gun in my face after I come out of Good Morning America and says, Braxton Hunter, you deny Bertuzianity right now or else you're going to die. I'm gonna drop Bertuzianity real quick if I know that it's not true. Because as the point often goes, people might live for something that they know. People live for something that, uh, that is a lie, but they might not die for something that's a lie. That's a very odd and rare thing. So the commitment level of, of these disciples. And then the, the T is for testimony. And there's two reasons for that. One reason is because I needed a T to spell out facts. You see how honest I am? <laughs> the other reason is because it's a point to reaffirm uh, you can share your own personal testimony of Jesus. And that's important because remember, we're doing evangelism here too. But also you can reaffirm uh, the testimony of scholarship on these other points that we've made. But it's also an opportunity for you to, to share your testimony. And then that brings us to S. S is for salvation. Now you say, oh, this is just too syrupy. Man, this is just too like preacher-like, man. Well, I'm sorry, but if you believe that we should defend the Christian faith, you gotta ask yourself why. And for my money, the reason you defend the Christian faith is number one, it can build up your own faith, as I say. But then number two, you can reach other people with the gospel message. And so... With salvation, it becomes really important because I think that, I'll say what Mike Lycona says, if a man dies and rises from the dead, we should probably believe what he says. And Jesus had a lot to say. And we would have to supply further argumentation to get to the authority of scripture and all those kind of things. But at the very least, what we could say is, if Jesus had things to say about heaven and hell and all those sorts of things and sin and the purpose for your life and all of that, then we should hear what he has to say. And we should share that with others and we should take it seriously. You know, um, I have shared this with many, many people, and I hear stories of people who have used apologetics and seen amazing fruit because of this. It, it doesn't often happen um, very quickly. It can. It usually takes time. But I think this is something that we ought to take seriously and consider making a part of what we do. Apologetics isn't just something for us to geek out about. That's fine. But apologetics is something that we have as a great blessing and a great tool to benefit the kingdom. And listen, I'll tell you, as, I, as my daughters get older and I hear cultural messages coming out of their mouth occasionally and coming at them and those sorts of things, I'm glad that we have firm reason to believe that Christianity is true. And I want everyone to know about it. Thank you so much. All right, let's get to some questions. Does anyone have a question for Braxton? I see this one went up first, so I'll come over here. Um, thank you so much. This was really fascinating, and I like how practical it is because I think there's a good balance between very intellectual and practical. At the same. Um, I wanted to ask, since experience has come up, it came up in the debate last night, and it comes up in your talk. Um, in, the, in Acts and in the letters of Paul, you see a very, very experiential, supernatural experience with the Holy Spirit which seems to be one of the primary pieces of evidence that comes up frequently in the letters and in the early church experience. So what role do you think the Holy Spirit should play 
uh, as a supernatural agent and the real presence of God in our lives, in our apologetics, and in the way that we approach Christianity in general? I so love this question. And the reason I love this question is because obviously, um, I think we should see the Holy Spirit as, as active when someone comes to faith. So, um, you know, often the criticism I get is from my Calvinist brothers and sisters. I'm not a Calvinist, but I love my Calvinist brothers and sisters. And in our class, uh, when we do contemporary apologetics, I'll get that question sometimes. They'll say, well, this evidential way of doing apologetics seems to circumvent the Holy Spirit or something. And my response to that is, hold on a second. Listen, every good Calvinist believes that God uses means, right? He uses means to accomplish what he wants. And so like the preaching of the gospel, how shall they hear without a preacher? This is very common. Calvinists will, will agree with me about that. And so um, what I say is, look, to preach means to proclaim the truth. That's what it means to preach. And so apologetics, a good apologetics presentation is in a certain sense preaching. The only difference is it's in, it involves evidence and argument. But, uh, but God can use those means in apologetics just as he can with the regular preaching, just proclamation evangelism. And so I think that that should be important and be a, something that we pray about. I'll tell you what, uh, the debates that I've had with, with skeptics, and this was true of Matt Dillahunty when I was debating him too, and Dan Barker, was that I, I prayed before the debate that the Holy Spirit would be involved in this, that, that I would perhaps think of things to say that I hadn't even planned to say, but more than that, that he would be the source of conviction for anyone in the audience who, who was ready to believe that it was their time to believe. And I, I think that that should be an important part of our apologetic, is to bathe it in prayer and seek the assistance of the Holy Spirit, because he's ultimately the one that does the work. Can you elaborate a bit on the S in salvation? Would that be like where you'd lay out your atonement theory? And is that going to sort of depend upon like maybe the notion of original sin? And so like, is somebody going to have to be committed to like the understanding of Adam and that whole connection to mm. the salvation that Jesus brings in, right. through the crucifixion and the resurrection? Yeah, I don't think that someone has to have their whole systematic figured out in order to become a Christian. Um, you know, I, I think that what, um, what we need to do is with the S is whatever your particular denominational perspective uh, would, would endorse as an evangelistic sort of statement or response, I think that's where you plug that in. That's why I kind of leave that a little bit open. My, do my doctoral work uh, was on the role of apologetics in the, in the evangelistic ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 21st century. So what I did there was I looked at uh, all of the different methodologies, you know, classical, evidential, cumulative case, presuppositional, all those, took those, that, and could these be used in, those, in that denomination? But what I realized there was, you know, within that one denomination, you have Calvinist presuppositionalists, you have evidentialists of various kinds, you have classical apologists, all these kind of things. So I thought, let's leave that ambiguous so that whatever the, what, you know, you can, you can kind of plug in there um, whatever you want for, sal for the salvation thing, as long, of course, as it's orthodox and, and not heretical. And so I leave that intentionally ambiguous. What I do, of course, I built this. this you, I bet no one in this room knows what this is. But there was an acrostic that was endorsed. There was a, a, a personal evangelism uh, tool that churches across America used in the late 90s called the Faith Soul Winning Program. And it was F-A-I-T-H, and each letter stood for something else. And when I originally put core facts together, I was thinking, hey, you could have the core facts of the faith. And then it would all work together, and you'd have the personal evangelism side of that. So if you want to see how I do it, Google the Faith Soul Winning Program, and you'll see kind of how I follow the core facts in that sal salvation thing. But to get to the deeper question, this, the specific doctrines and things like that, I think just let your denominational perspective fill in how you do your evangelism. But I don't think you have to have pristine and complete systematic theology before you can become a Christian. And I know you weren't suggesting that. So, yeah. There you go. All right, I think we have time for just a couple more. Oh, no. Yep. Hello. Um, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my, my question, um, I guess just a general question. So my approach to apologetics is different, sort of. I'm a more Bayesian, so like I take, I take the uh, approach of Richard Swinburne, if anyone knows who that is. Um, so like my question is, like, is this, this can apply to like all forms of apologies, not just uh, classical or evidential, but like even this sort of Bayesian probability that I sort of use with that yeah, word as well? Yeah, I, I think so, because the topics that are covered 
in these, in these things that we covered, you don't have to, you can, you can frame those up differently, right? You could frame them up in a Bayesian way. You could frame it up in ab, abductively. You could do different things with them. Um, but uh, so I think you could still keep the acronym and just go about that differently or make up your own acronym. The primary goal is, or don't use an acronym at all. The primary goal is just to use this stuff for evangelism. And so you do, you, I know about your ministry and he's got a fantastic channel, very unique. And there's a lot of things there that I don't even know what you're talking about. So <laughs> if you, <laughs> so, but I mean, it's really scholarly. I just don't, and so uh, you could maybe frame a way that it could be used practically. And that could even be a great series on your channel, I think, for evangelism. Yeah. All right, over, we're over here. In the, okay. You see me. All right, here we go. Santi. Uh, hi, Braxton. Hey, man. Uh, so for us that like apologetics, like how do we get our churches to get more involved and, and basically embrace the idea of having a more intellectual approach to Christianity and stuff like that? So that's the question, isn't it? Because apologists have been trying to do that for a long time now, or at least throughout the 2000s. And um, I, I have a couple of things to say about that real briefly because Cameron's looking at me again. One is, um, one is, I think that churches, and if there are pastors and youth pastors here, this is something I haven't heard anyone say. Maybe they are saying it, but I think this is so important, and please do this. Think of a way that you can make it, make your congregations and the people that come, pu- make it public knowledge to them that if you're experiencing intellectual worldview doubt, not like doubt about your salvation, we should address that too, but like worldview doubt, like we're talking about here, that there is a place to talk about that in our church. Um, that there, you know, make it clear in, on your website or in the literature that you hand out in the church or even a signage with an actual physical spot in the church so that when people are experiencing doubt, they can go there. Because while I haven't found the level of frustration when people experience doubts that I hear my atheist friends and atheist YouTubers talking about, I know that it has happened, that people feel afraid to say that they're doubting because of how people might think about them. So whether that's a reality in your church or not, they might think it's a reality. So it'd be good to have a place they know they can go where it's set up to to do that, to talk about that. And some of the good apologetic material is there. That's one thing. Another thing is Get them, I think this is what my D-Men doctoral project, and I did empirical research on this and went and did small groups and we did Likert scale tests before and after to see if we could track how it went. It was great. And that is get church people doing apologetics with other church people, other Christians who are professing Christians, but who are experiencing worldview doubt. That gives you the people to work that spot that I just told you about. And then number two, um, it, it, it's not as scary for the Christian because they're starting out with somebody they might know or at least they know is a professing Christian. So I think those are a couple of things that we can do. Also, Lee Strobel's longtime uh, suggestion that start a small group and invite unbelievers to come in, tell them they can ask whatever they want, say whatever they want, just as long as they're respectful. That's another fantastic way. All right, let's give Braxton another hand. Thanks, guys. Hey, it's me again. Uh, Actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?